Good morning, class. Uh, welcome back. We're going to be discussing today a small feature of the mid 19th century, a development that at first glance maybe not doesn't seem that important to our understanding of American environmental history, but when we take into account sort of the broader historical context of this time, and specifically the transition of the United States from what had been a largely subsistence farming mode of production to that of a market um, revolution toward capitalism and this is expressed in terms of agriculture being sold for a market but also a whole host of industries that are being established on the east coast that are drawing upon the natural resources of the interior of the growing United States. It's also worth noting that by the mid 19th century the United States has effectively expanded all the way to the Pacific. So in the course of just a handful of decades the United States has doubled its size twice and has become a much larger larger uh, geographic realm. And so in the midst of all this uh, as I mentioned just briefly in class we have this idea that nature so to speak um, the natural environment of the United States, and nature would have been the term probably used in the mid-19th century to describe it, is sort of undergoing a fundamental reconsideration. And what I mean by that is we know that when the early colonists, English colonists, began arriving on the East Coast, the Atlantic, uh, back in the 1500s, well, and with greater numbers starting in the 1600s, there was this perception that wilderness was evil, that it was forbidding, almost as if it were haunted. It was not a place that was thought of as sacred. If anything, it was a obstacle that the early colonists would demonstrate their chosenness by God by rising above this obstacle, this very threatening, ominous, daunting obstacle. But by the mid-19th century, a lot has changed. and. Part of it is, is that the natural environment has been tapped for many of its resources and in the process of being tapped and harvested and mined and cut, uh, it has become a more domesticated version of its former self and thus perhaps not as much to be feared. So that's one development that's happening. It's being used as a resource base. But also in the midst of this transition from a pre-market revolution to a post-market revolution society, many Americans are asking the question, is there something being lost here? Is the transformation of our natural environment a good thing? Is industry all that it's cracked up to be? Should we just proceed wholeheartedly into taking what is wild and what is unknown and turning it into something very familiar, tamed, domesticated. And it's into this critical period in American history that the Hudson River School artists uh, enter. And here we have pictures of Thomas Cole, Asher B. Durand. Uh, we could also include Albert Bierstadt. Uh, there's a whole half dozen of, of artists that really fit this, um, fit this time. Uh, Thomas Moran would be another one. So anyway, the Hudson River School really, we to fully understand um, this phenomenon, along the Hudson River in uh, sort of heading out of New York City to the west and north, the Hudson River had traditionally been uh, colonized by the Dutch. And this is important because in Holland at that in the um, 1500s and 1600s, landscape painting had been something uh, that was uh, a fairly um, common artistic form of artistic expression. And it's through the Dutch influence that the Hudson River School painters come to accentuate the, the landscape. And as I'll explain in a minute, the capturing of the landscape is one that's, that really speaks to the changing nature of how uh, Americans are perceiving their natural environment. Uh, for starters, it's worth noting that in Europe, uh, even though the United States had established its independence, had fought the Revolutionary War, and 
set itself distinctly apart from Great Britain. Europeans still sort of stared down their noses at the young United States in the early 1800s. The perception was that the United States did not have much to offer in terms of culture. Its writers were sophomoric, its painters were kind of the junior varsity team of uh, you know the world's uh, cultural sophistication. There was a lot to sort of pick on and make fun of in terms of the United States and its culture. But one of the things that became evident was that the one thing that the United States had that other parts of Europe couldn't really touch was this vast natural environment and this treasure, these places of sublime beauty, these tall, majestic mountains and waterfalls like Niagara Falls. Later we'll discover things like the, um, you know, the, the um, mud pots and uh, geysers and geothermal activity at Yellowstone and the incredible um, elevations and abrupt uh, canyons of Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, all these wonderful natural features and those kind of became the true cultural addition that the United States had to offer to Europe. Even to this day Europeans come to the United States each summer to see our wonderful natural landmarks. And so it's no surprise that one of the ways that the Hudson River School painters tried to call attention to their work was by focusing on something that was in many ways missing from the rest of um, the arts in the world. And so here we have it, the Hudson River School uh, painters. So what they start to see, and I'll show it to you more, um, I'll try to be a little bit more um, concrete and try to demonstrate this a little better for you when we look at the actual paintings. But there's this idea of wilderness, and wilderness undergoes something of a change. The painters seem to be portraying wilderness in a couple of different ways. Um, one as still mysterious and sublime, but there's this idea that wilderness is somewhat majestic, and we'll see that over time it even changes, even in the Hudson River School painters' perception. And we can use their depictions of their natural environment to speak somewhat of the changes that the United States is going through economically and culturally in the mid-19th century. And to do this, we're going to need to understand three different, three different levels. In their paintings, there tend to be depictions of wild. Then there's a depiction of something that's pastoral, meaning something that's been lightly touched by human hands. So maybe a field, a, a farming field. <clears throat> it's part of human influence. It's land that is under human influence, maybe cultivation and domestication, but it hasn't been fully tamed or transformed. It's certainly not a city. It hasn't been overrun and fully occupied. And then you have civilization, this idea where civilization, where people's hand, the human hand, is very clearly felt. Maybe it's even paved or uh, the streets are cobbled, you know, cobblestone. Buildings have been erected and, uh, you know, parks have been uh, perhaps established and, you know, very much show the human uh, presence in the human touch. So uh, that's the, the brief explanation of the Hudson River School painters and their work. This first piece, you'll note the date on it, it's 1827. So this is still pretty early in the Hudson River School um, painting. Uh, it really starts about this time. And in this painting, I don't know, it's kind of maybe difficult for you to see, but as is typical of the Hudson River School painters, there's usually a division within the uh, painting where you have one depiction, maybe wilderness, the pastoral, or the civilized on one half, and then the other on the other half. Another common feature is, is that there's something that connects the two. Now you'll see this painting is titled Expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And what we have here in the background on the side, it's tough to see because it's so bright, but this is depicted, or intended to depict the Garden of Eden, which is sort of a pastoral place, meaning a garden, right? A garden is something where nature is at work growing, but yet it's domesticated in the sense that humans are planting it. So this is the pastoral. 
it's that land that is somewhat natural but also somewhat touched by the human hand. Then you have this pathway that connects the pastoral part of the picture with the wilderness part, the wild. And if you look at this part of the painting, it looks, um, pardon me, it looks, it looks rather um, treacherous in many respects. If you squint, you can see a very small Adam and Eve who are walking out of the Garden of Eden. They've been essentially exiled by God for Eve and Adam's indiscretions. And now they're no longer welcome in this beautiful, wonderful pastoral landscape. They're now being pushed out into the wilderness. And as you can see, the wilderness here is a very foreboding part of the picture, the painting. You have clouds that look ominous. The red sky here almost looks like anger. You can see a waterfall that's just raging underneath. I think in the foreground, you can see uh, uh, this looks like something of a I don't know if it's a wolf, but it's preying on, it uh, looks like a deer carcass, uh, sort of showing the, um, you know, the enmity and, um, uh, I guess, uh, intensity and pred predator and prey relationships of wilderness. I sense wind here. So this is an effort, if you think about it, by Thomas Cole to depict the pastoral as ideal and wilderness as still somewhat forbidding. Uh, but you see, the emphasis here isn't that civilization is great. The emphasis is that the pastoral is great. So um, that's kind of an early introduction. Now we're a little bit further on. It's about 10 years later, and here we have Thomas Cole depicting another uh, Hudson River School painting. And in this painting, you see some of the same old devices, right? The, the, the painting appears to be divided roughly in half. You have what is the pastoral landscape over here. This looks like, you know, maybe there's been even some timber harvests. It looks like maybe grazing land or farmland that's been lightly touched by human hands. And then in the foreground, we have a sort of intense wilderness, uh, again, sort of forbidding it seems like in this painting, the ideal um, landscape is the pastoral landscape, that which has been lightly touched by human hands and quote-unquote improved. There still seems to be a level of ominous concern about nature, okay? The wild, the wilderness is somewhat scary in this painting, okay? Moving on. Oh, let me go back actually really quick. You also see here a, a somewhat curious device by Thomas Cole. It's an oxbow, but this is in the shape of a question mark. So it leaves the paint, the viewer of this painting maybe to think, ah, oh, maybe Thomas Cole is trying to make a statement here about the future and the direction in which uh, civilization is headed. So that's a uh, important and curious part of that painting. Uh, 1836, still about the same year. In this painting, if I were to ask you, there's a division, but it's interesting. We don't seem to have much of a pastoral landscape. In this painting, Thomas Cole shows the civilized foreground, and then in the background, it appears to be a wilderness, and this wilderness is looking out to the ocean. This looks to me like Rome, and this is part of a series of paintings called The Course of Empire. This is the final piece called Destruction. And it appears as though Cole is saying, you know what, when, um, when civilization becomes too entrenched and too far along, it actually has destructive qualities. So in the foreground, we see like riots, decay, uh, there's kind of some unrest that you can see if you squint and see, it looks like this woman is jumping over the wall into the water. Boats are crashing in the foreground. This is not a stable or enviable situation to be in. Okay, And in the far off, it almost looks like the wilderness part is a little bit more settled. Finally, I'll conclude, this is a later piece, um, and it shows an incredible beauty of, of wilderness. And I'll leave you with this thought that the Hudson River School seems to be suggesting over time 
that wilderness goes from being a forbidding place to an ideal. And this is a beautiful depiction of it. Thank you.